Hi there, I'm Gary. I'm an ordinary bloke doing stuff. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Today I'm building an iconic fighter from the Second World War, the Mitsubishi Zero in 172nd scale from Airfix. The one I'm building comes from the rather lovely package of this dogfight double where it's pitched up against the Grumman Wildcat. They do sell the Zero as a standalone kit However, the parts are identical. It's just the paint scheme and decals are a bit different. Okay, so building it out of this box is the same as building the standalone model. So we'll have a quick look at the history of the Zero. We'll have a look at the parts in here, which are the Zero, see what you get with your kit, and then I'll show you how to put it all together. All of these bits come as separate chapters in the video, so you can hop backwards and forwards yeah, whilst well, you're waiting for a wing to set, have a look at the history, that kind of thing, as you desire. Okay, so why don't we make a start? The Mitsubishi A6M0 was one of the outstanding fighters in the early years of World War II, probably the best to serve on aircraft carriers in its day. The name Zero comes from the Japanese term Reisen, or Zero Fighter, named after the last digit of the Imperial year, 2600, in which it entered service. The Zero was designed by a team led by the brilliant Jiro Torikoshi. Extreme requirements are placed on the design, so to make it as light as possible, a new top-secret alloy, called Extra Special Jirolumin, was developed using aluminium alloyed with zinc, magnesium and copper. Although strong and light, it was prone to corrosion, so Zero's used a blue-green protective coating known as Aotake to withstand salty sea air. The prototype Zero flew in April 1939 and entered service with the Imperial Japanese Navy in July 1940. It was intended to be able to defeat fighters such as the Curtis P-40 Warhawk and the Polycarpov I-16. The Zero turned out to be an exceptional fighter, with very high manoeuvrability, prodigious range and powerful armament from two 20mm cannon and two 7.7mm machine guns. In the early years of the war, the Zero was the dominant fighter in the Pacific Theatre. Many Zeros were part of the force that attacked Pearl Harbour in 1941 and the type served at sea all the way until the end of the war. It wasn't until mid-1943 that the Allies could get the upper hand on the Zero. Testing captured aircraft and listening to combat reports helped develop tactics that kept the combat at higher speeds where the Zero was weakest, and the introduction of better armed aircraft such as the Hellcat and the Corsair sealed the Zero's fate. Toward the end of the war, many Zeros would end their days as mounts for kamikaze pilots, making desperate suicide attacks on naval vessels. With around 11,000 aircraft built, the Zero was the most produced Japanese aircraft of the war. Perhaps surprisingly, many survive in museums, and several Zeros are flying, although often with little original metal remaining. One aircraft, flown at the Plains of Fame Museum in California, flies with an original Sakai engine. So, let's see what we get in the box. Now remember, I'm building this from a dogfight double set, so the standalone model will be packed slightly differently. Well, in here we have various plastic bags. This first one is the dynamic stand, so you can display the two aircraft flying together. Not for me today. Then we have a bag with all the bits for the Wildcat. Then there is the bag of parts of the Zero that we'll look at in a moment. And there's another bag with nine pots of paint, two brushes, and a tube of polystyrene cement. Then there's this double leaflet of instructions. Again, in the standalone kit, you'll obviously just have the Zero. In this leaflet, the Wildcat is first, followed by the Zero. And everything is pretty much as usual for FX, with well-drawn and clear instructions.
Then we have this decal sheet. Once again, the standalone will be different. Here the sheet includes both aircraft, so the zero is here in the bottom half. Decals are nicely printed with good colour and sharp edges, as is more normal today. The bag with the bits of the zero is here, and these are the same contents as in the standalone kit. There are three grey plastic sprues for the aircraft, plus one clear one with the canopy. Now the mouldings look pretty good with little flash. Some of the sprue design makes life a bit tricky to get some parts off, as we'll see later, but generally it's holding up well for a tooling that first came out in 2011. This gift set contains a Wildcat and Zero together, so it comes with a token for two flying hours. Note here it says skill level 2. The standalone Zero is skill level 1, so I assume this must be for the Wildcat. The standalone kit gives you just the one flying hour. Now you can collect flying hours as a member of the Airfix Club towards a free kit in the future, or you can donate them to Models for Heroes. A link to this excellent charity is in the information box below. So now we'll see how we make the Airfix Zero. As usual, I've given the parts a wash and some diluted detergent and given them a gentle coat of grey primer. Then I'm going to paint some of the parts while they're still on the sprue, starting with the cockpit floor here. Now for the interior I'm using a Tamiya cockpit green. I'll also do the pilot seat as well. Next are the inside walls of the cockpit, also in the Tamiya cockpit green, on both halves of the fuselage. Make sure you get into all the little corners. Next I'll take the control column off the sprue, there's a small nub of plastic on the side to trim off. You'll notice I've already painted the front and back frames of the cockpit section as well. The control column goes into a little hole on the cockpit floor like this and when the glue's dry I'll paint it green. Once that interior green has dried I'm going to apply a shading wash to the cockpit walls. I use a reasonably heavy wash, not the full black, but not too diluted either. You can dampen the piece with a brush first if you like, then use the wash so it fills into the corners easily. Use the paintbrush to push the wash around. You can use the wash on the cockpit floor as well. I'll let all that dry so I'll turn to the instruments. Now as normal I use reverse tweezers to hold the backing paper of the decals and a damp brush to push the decals around. There are three decals for the instrument panel that go over the cockpit green I've already painted. The top and bottom ones are really small, but the middle one is quite a bit bigger. Get them all lined up and let them dry. When they're all set, they do look pretty good. Then I'm going to go around the fuselage picking up a few boxes in black, just for variety really. On the cockpit floor section, I'll also add black to the top of the control column and also to the throttle quadrant on the left side here. On then to the construction of the cockpit. First the instrument panel goes in at the front end. Next I'll fit the seat to this rear bulkhead. There are some pegs to align the seat, very similar to a lot of Spitfire kits I've made in fact. Then that completed rear bulkhead can be joined to the cockpit floor. Next the cockpit assembly can go into the fuselage. Now a thing to remember here is that this headrest kind of thing sort of hooks over the back edge of the cockpit that allows the rest of the parts to sit nicely into place. Then we can join the two halves of the cockpit together, use clamps or tape to hold them while the glue sets up. Now while that's drying I'll start on the engine. One bank of cylinders comes in this ring of plastic sprue, which is a bit of a pain. What I've done is use a craft knife to roughly cut it out, then trim the sprue ends off. The bottom end of the blade tends to keep its edge best, so just very gently push against the plastic and the sprue end will trim off. But do press gently. Don't want you chopping off the rockers at the end of the cylinders. Then there is this propeller shaft that pushes through the front cylinder bank. 
Then the rear cylinder bank goes on the back. Note how the cylinders are offset, not one behind the other. When the engine is dry, you can paint it. I'm using Vallejo Metal Colour Burnt Iron for this. Now, back to the fuselage and a tricky bit. Now, I've painted this U-shaped piece, which represents the ends of the machine guns that poke into the cockpit, and I've attached it to this upper skin section. Now, what it says you do is sort of just put it into a gap at the top of the fuselage. Now, there are a couple of plastic lips that will support the upper panel, but they kind of stop the gun piece from going through. In the end, what I did was I pushed the piece through from the front end, even though this made the gun piece come away slightly, then when the panel was back in place, I could pull the guns up into the right position with some tweezers. Next, we're going to place the engine on the fuselage. So the inside of the cowling and the rear firewall, first of all, get a coat of black. The engine has two different sized tabs to make sure they put it in the right way. You'll know it's right if this tiny tab here is at top center. Then the cowling can go over the engine. Make sure the slots for the machine gun rounds line up with that top panel we've put in. Then leave the fuselage alone for a bit. I think it's been through enough. Okay, next are the wings. Now, the Zero had these tiny, small folding sections at the wingtips. I've painted them here red, just for clarity. The folded wing bits are supplied, so if you're doing a wing fold, cut off this bit. Note that the ailerons stick out at one end, so don't chop them off as well. Once you've done that, you can join the halves of the two wings together, and then again use tape or clamps to hold them firmly in place while the glue goes off. When they are set, you can add the wings to the fuselage. Slot the front end underneath the engine cowling first and then push the rear down into place. You can also add the rudder at this point if you like. Now I'm preparing to paint a few more things on the sprue. I should say here, don't be worried to chop off bits of sprue if it's in your way, like here with this tail wheel. Cut off whatever you need to get easy access. Now, I don't normally paint the pilot, but I've had a few people asking me to, and I'm happy to go along with any requests from my subscribers, provided they're reasonable, physically possible, and legal and achievable within a tight budget. So, this pilot I'm giving an olive drab flying suit. Then his life vest, I'm painting a kind of darkish sea grey. Make sure you get into all the cracks here. Then the boots and leather flying helmet I'm doing with a mahogany brown. I'm also using pale flesh tone for his face and his hands. And the oxygen mask I'll pick out in black. Finally, I'll add a couple of dots of aluminium for the goggles. Now I'll let all that dry out for a moment, but while I've got the aluminium out, I'll also add that to kind of imitate the glass on the gun sight. Makes it stand out a little bit. Now this is where the magic happens. When the pilot's dry, I'm gonna add some of that black wash I used in the cockpit earlier. Just see how much detail it creates. Next I'll add a bit of white to the olive drab and just touch in a few highlights using a number zero brush. Now, all the detail here really is just smoke and mirrors. You'll be viewing it from a distance so it will look really detailed but you can paint it relatively easily. Now, do the same thing on the life vest, a few highlights of the lighter colour. If you really want to, you can add a moustache but otherwise you've got a pretty decent pilot with not too much effort. When he's finished, he can go into his cockpit. It's quite a struggle, so 
perhaps I suggest you cut him off at the boots. Then, when he's settled, I'll put the canopy on. I'm fixing it using Revel Contact to Clear, with a toothpick to apply it in small amounts to the frame and to the transparency. Leave them for a few minutes and then place the transparency onto the fuselage. I find a bit of blue tack helps a lot here. Then leave it all to set. A few more things to paint on the sprue. Uh, now I'll start on the wheels. The hubs get painted in aluminium. I'll also start on the propellers, painting the forward sides in aluminium and the rear sides get painted black. So back to the canopy. I'm going to spray this kit so I need to do a canopy mask. Now I'm using some plastic masking tape as I find it easier to pull into curves as it goes over the canopy. I'll do several strips for the windows then just trim to the frames. Use a very sharp fresh tipped blade in your craft knife or scalpel. I find the plastic cuts a lot more cleanly but it does have less ability to nudge around than paper based masking tape. Anyway. With that done, I'll just stuff some tissue paper over the engine as well. Now to colour. So, the Humbrol number 90 supplied with this, remember it comes from the Dogfight double gift set, turned out to be a very strange mid-blue and not the beige green as needed and advertised. I think this pot of paint has been badly labelled. So, Instead of thinning the humbrol enough to spray, I'm going to mix up what I already have. Now after a few experiments, I found that a 50-50 mix of Sky Type S and Insignia White was pretty close to what's printed on the instructions. It's not too far off what's on the side of the box too. So I've done a final prime and I can start painting. Now as the colour started to go on, I thought it looked just a bit too pale blue for my liking. I did do a couple of coats and I let it dry. I even added the black to the cowling to see if the contrast made a difference, but it didn't. So what I ended up doing was eight parts sky type S, six parts white and one part of UK light stone. I sprayed up one wing and the improvement was obvious to me. So I finished all the outside with that mix and let it dry. Back to the wheels now. Now I saw this on YouTube a little while ago and I've done it ever since. Using a fine black marker to chase into the rim of the tyre makes it easy to get a decent edge when you're painting. Now I know some people will say well I can do that anyway yada 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 but if the rim is only just in relief from the tyre this trick can really help. I'm painting the rubber with Vallejo tyre black. Now that other odd thing from our Japanese friends is the use of a transparent bluey green sealant on exposed metal surfaces such as the insides of gear doors. You can see it in restored aircraft. That's the thing called Aotaki Blue and I'm not buying a pot of that just for this model even though Vallejo and other makers do them. What I have done is mixed one part aluminium with two parts of signal blue, that really dark one for RAF roundels. That makes something that's a pretty good replica of Aotake. It also goes on the exposed innards of the wings at the fold point. Next thing I'm doing is laying down a quick coat of satin varnish, then I'll start to apply the decals. Now I have used a decal setting solution, I, I use Microset, to get into the panel lines. It also helps prevent silvering, with, especially with some of the larger decals that have got a lot of unprinted area, like these walk limit lines on the wings. When the decals have dried completely, I'll add a bit more satin varnish and then do the panel lines. For this one, I'm going a bit heavier than normal as I'd like to plane to look a little bit more ragged and used. Now there are two ways of doing this really that I can see. One is to run water along the panel lines with a fine brush. 
then dot bits of panel wash at strategic points and let the wash spread along by itself. Alternatively, you can use a slightly thinner wash and just run it along the panel line yourself, which is what I'm doing here. I use a size double O brush for this, but make sure it's one with a bit longer hair, more like a, an artist's brush. It doesn't take long to do, and here you can really see the difference. For the engine cowling, I'm going to do something similar, but with diluted aluminium paint. Just wipe off any excess before it dries. You can, of course, also use a silver pencil to pick out the edges of the panels, or specialist weathering pencils, of course. Next, I'm painting the little stub exhaust on the bottom of the nose and the gum barrels on the top of the nose in that burnt iron colour. I think it just looks a bit better than gum metal. Now a bit of dirt. Here I have some black Revel weathering powder. I've got an old small brush that I've chopped the hairs down to a few millimetres in length to make a, a really small stubby brush. I can use it to pick up some powder and kind of poke it into the paint to simulate gun smoke from the wing cannons. Just do it bit by bit and it builds up slowly. Always do too little rather than too much. You can also do the same around the nose guns. Then under the fuselage I'm going to do the same with some deep brown weathering powder to simulate a bit of engine soot. Again, do as much or as little as you want. Now with all that done, I'll attach the tailplanes. You'll note I remember to do their panel lines already. Then the undercarriage. Now the gear leg goes into the side of the wheel with the nuts on the hub. Then the gear door goes on the other side with these small lugs touching the gear leg. Note the blue atake on the inside of the gear door. Let all these parts dry. The pre-painted tail wheel goes in next, and in front of that goes the arrestor hook. Then I can fit the folded wing tips. Again, I've already panel painted these, and they simply sit vertically at the ends of the wings. With a final coat of satin varnish, I've finished messing around with the outside and I can pull off all the canopy mask segments and the plane looks like a plane again. I can also take out the tissue from the engine bay. The main undercarriage legs have dried so they can go into place. Now Airfix does give precise angles for these to sit at, but for me, just a bit of forward of the vertical and the tiniest bit inward will do. The propeller I'm assembling now, the blades fit onto a back plate and then the spinner sits on top. I'll paint the spinner in aluminium in a moment. With the undercarriage fitted I can add the rest of the gear doors. There's a tiny door that goes at the bottom of the main leg, then there is an inner door that sits on the side with an actuator arm that sits into a hole in the wheel well. Next, the pitot tube. Now, the hole for this has disappeared, so I'm using a 0.7 millimeter drill to make it. The radio mask goes into place at the back of the canopy. Now remember, it does lean forward a bit. Then I can add the propeller to the front. Now the very last thing I'm going to add are these two tiny little aileron arms that need to go onto the top of the wing. And with those done, my Mitsubishi Zero is complete. Do you know, I've really enjoyed this build. I like the folding wing tips. The kit all seemed to go together pretty well with a few issues, of course. There was the thing with the upper nose panel and the guns. And there was a slight problem fitting the pilot, but otherwise I think it went well. Oh, and the wrong paint in the box, of course, but still, I enjoyed the build. 
If you enjoyed it too, then please do remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, so you get notification of new builds and you can rummage through the back catalogue of builds too. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.